Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. I was living a life that I was going out at the weekends and partying and doing all those kind of things. The business was going very, very well. I was making money. I was investing in property. I was doing a lot of traveling. But in the inside, all wasn't well. There was this gentle little voice within me and calling me to become a priest. And the hardest thing for me to give up to become a priest was my business. The grace that God gave me enabled me to say no to these things. I felt being a priest was a way for me to tell the world about the great love of God. I grew up in a pretty normal enough family, I would think, in Cork City, a place called Bishopstown in Cork. I loved sport growing up, played football, soccer, Irish football and hurling. The idea of a vocation, I suppose, might have come to me once or twice when I was younger, but I really didn't understand it, nor was I too interested, I must say. I had great plans. I wanted to get into business like my father. My father was a bit of an entrepreneur, had a few different companies. He had a pilgrimage company. So we would go to Lourdes quite a bit. I would go to Lourdes as a tour guide and go to Fatima as well. Fatima would be my, my favorite pilgrimage site. And so I decided to go to the university and to study business. And I was there for four years and I really enjoyed it. And after that, I went to Dublin. I went to the Smurfit Business College there and I studied marketing and did a master's. And then I decided to go to London. I found a job there with an internet company that had just raised $32 million. And I worked in the marketing department of the company. And it was a wonderful experience, but I felt a call to kind of come home. And with that experience that I had gained in London, I got a good job in Dublin. And I worked for another internet business for three years. I got busy. I was living, you know, a life that many in our country are living these days in the 20s. You know, I was going out at the weekends and partying and doing all those kind of things. And I felt a call to go back to London. I felt I had unfinished business in London. I maybe thought the pond in Dublin wasn't big enough and I had to go back to London. So I worked for one of my clients over there. And after about nine months, I was still a bit unsettled and I decided that it was time for me to start my own business, which was my real dream. So I set up a business called Zip Marketing Limited. And then as the mobile arena started to take off, I started to do a bit in that as well, as well as telecommunications. So I got very, very busy. The business was going very, very well. I was making money. I was investing in property. I was doing a lot of traveling and people thought I was doing great. But in the inside, all wasn't well. I suppose there was this gentle little voice within me calling me and calling me to become a priest. I suppose really take my faith more seriously by taking up the diary of St. Faustina, which someone had given me about three years before. It was my father who gave it to me and it had remained up on the bookshelf. But I eventually decided to look into this book, which he had given me, Diary of St. Faustina, in explaining God's mercy, what Jesus had done for me made me really think about my life and that was really the time when I understood God's great love for me and I found the real treasure in life and a big change and transformation happened within me and then the things that had been so important to me, career and success and how you're perceived in the world were no longer as important to me and I began to seriously think about a vocation. I began to have 
a reason to become a priest. So it started off with a call, but I didn't really want to become a priest or understand why I should become a priest. But now I understood God's love and his mercy, what he had done for me, how I had abandoned him, how I had, you know, gone away from him. This newfound peace was something I didn't want to let go of. And I had this great desire within me that the whole world should know about God's love and experience this great peace and to know how much God had done for them and how he had died for us. And so I know what a purpose to become a priest. It all kind of came together for me. It was March 19th, 2008, when I decided to become a priest. And I remember being in front of the Lord in the tabernacle and I said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna give it a go because I think this is what you want me to do. And I experienced this profound peace. It was amazing. And that was the confirmation from God that I was doing what he wanted me to do. And I remember the next day I had to go back to London on business. I still had my business in London. And I got a phone call that morning from a friend of mine who wanted to start up this uh, chain of restaurants in London and in the greater London area. He wanted me to get involved and be a partner in it. This was a huge opportunity, but I remember explaining to him, no, it's not for me right now. And I was able to say no to that because the Lord had given me so much grace. It just wasn't attractive to me anymore. But a year before I would have bitten his hand off, but the grace that God gave me enabled me to say no to these things. They just weren't important to me. And the hardest thing for me to give up to become a priest was my business. I had, it had been my dream and I had built it up and it had been successful, but I had found the true treasure. And my focus now was on telling the world about God's love. At that point, I decided to approach the bishop and he sent me to the seminary. I had some great times in seminary, enjoyed especially playing football, soccer with the guys, and we traveled to Germany for a football tournament and we won it, which was great. And we did many great things. I suppose seminary also challenges you. And when I look back, I think of just the genius of God in creating the seminary and sending us to seminary before we become priests, before we become ordained, because we, when we enter the seminary, we're not ready for priesthood. And we have to discern really, is this what God is calling me to do? Through the trials and tribulations that come our way, we're challenged. I think the greatest challenge is to go inside yourself and to meet who you really are. The Lord, in a way, dismantles you. And that can be unpleasant for all of us. None of us enjoy that. But we have to be kind of rebuilt so we're ready for the mission that the Lord has prepared for us. Seminary was challenging at times. The exams were difficult at times. I spent some time in Rome as well where we did oral exams. Whereas when I was in Maynooth in Ireland, there were written exams. So that was a different experience. And it was wonderful to be in Rome and experience the universality of the Catholic Church. It was a very rewarding and enriching experience being in the seminary and helped me come to know myself so much better. Well, life as a priest has been very, very fulfilling. There really isn't a day or a moment where I have regretted becoming a priest. And I suppose the main reason for this is a lot of my life I was chasing things, chasing maybe success and the opinion of others, affirmation of others and you know, wanting to do well in the world and all those things which are kind of attractive and are tempting. But I never really had inner peace and contentment and this feeling of being at home. And since I answered the Lord's call, I've had that. I feel I am who I'm meant to be now. And there's a great peace and satisfaction with that. I remember reading John Paul II saying about his own vocation that he said just in offering the Mass, he was just so happy and at home. I didn't really understand it at the time, but I can relate to that now. Just in doing the simple everyday things of being a priest, you know, mass and being with people and praying and working with the young people as I have in the university here for three years and then going on and working in, in a hospital and being with the sick, being with people, you know, at very difficult moments, helping to shoulder the burdens a bit. It's very, very privileged work as a priest and I'm very happy as a priest, and I love being a priest. Of course, there are difficulties and challenges like everyone has. I marvel at parents, the way they get up at two, three, four in the morning, 
for their children without a second's thought and the great sacrifices they make in their lives. And priesthood is similar. You know, we do have to make sacrifices and be available for the people, but the inner contentment and joy that we experience makes it all worthwhile. And I just hope that I'm helping people to come to know the Lord. I suppose what drives me day to day, if you like, is my prayer life really. And I find it just so important to be in front of Jesus. I have to hold the hand of my mother, my mother Mary as well during the day. The rosary really helps me praying with scripture as well. And as a priest, it's very important that you continue to study and you continue to form yourselves so that you know our homilies and our teachings are constantly evolving and we're constantly able to help people. So it's a wonderful part of the priesthood that you know we are called to, to pray a little bit more. And no matter how busy a day is, no matter how difficult, no matter what I've gone through, when I sit there with the Lord or on my knees, I find great peace and comfort and the strength to carry on. I'd been going to Fatima since I was ordained and bringing a group there every year. 2017, it was the 100th year anniversary, the centenary of that great apparitions in Fatima. And I felt that it was time to start a little magazine in Ireland. So I was inspired by Maximilian Kolbe, the great Polish saint, and the magazine that he started in Poland. And so we started a magazine here called Totus to Us. And I began also to promote the rosary. The rosary had always been very dear to me because I have very fond memories of praying the rosary with my father and mother. And the rest of the family had grown up and they had left. I'm the youngest, so I was there with them and just the three of us praying the rosary together when we would be traveling in the car or at nighttime before bed. And it really meant so much to me. And when I became a priest, this Marian devotion really started to grow within me again. We started something called the One in Ten Rosary Mission in Ireland, and the goal is to get 10% of the country, or one in 10 people, to pray the rosary every day. And this was the message of Fatima. Our Lady said in each of the six apparitions, she wants us to pray the rosary. The rosary has transformed my life, kept me connected to Our Lady who brings me closer to Jesus. And if I have our Lady in my life, I really have nothing to fear. She said in Fatima, my immaculate heart will be your refuge. In meditating on the mysteries of the rosary, we contemplate the life of Christ and we grow deeper in that contemplation when we pray the rosary. So the rosary has helped me enormously as well as a priest with my sermons, with my homilies to prepare well. For instance, if we're celebrating the Feast of the Ascension, I've meditated on so many times in praying the rosary that when, I may, when I'm preaching to the people, the fruit of that meditation really can come out and I can share my own experiences and inspirations of the Holy Spirit. A relationship with Mary is non-negotiable really as Catholics, as Christians. She is the mother of God. She is there to help us. Jesus came to us through Mary. So having a relationship with your heavenly mother, who Jesus gave us from the cross, behold your mother, he said to John and he said to all of us, having a relationship with her will only bring you closer to Jesus, safeguard you in your faith. And as I said, she will bestow special, special graces upon you. When I think of great priests and priests whose example really inspires me, priests that I try to imitate, I think of Saint Padre Pio and also Saint Jean-Marie Vianney, the Curie of ours. Padre Pio was a priest of our own time, really. I've read extensively about him. He inspires me to be a better priest and to be available for people, and especially to be available in the sacrament of confession. I've had great experiences in my own life of confession, really transformative experiences. And as a priest, it is one of the greatest joys when someone comes into confession when they open their heart, when they're completely honest, when they want to change, and you see the, the chains falling off, 
and their lives have changed. And Saint Faustina was told by Jesus that the greatest miracles in the world happen in the confessional. And another priest who inspires me in that sense is, as I said, the Curie of Ars, who spent up to 16 hours a day hearing confessions. I've heard confessions on the rare occasion for a few hours. It's very difficult. You have to continue to concentrate. The Curie of Ars did this like Padre Pio, day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And God did great, great things through the Curie of Ars. And I suppose as a priest, you're in a unique position because you are a penitent and also you are a confessor. And so hearing good and honest and humble confessions inspires you to be a better penitent. I go to confession every week or two if I can. I have to find my own priest, of course, and sometimes that is easier than others. But we are receiving tremendous graces every time we go to confession. We have this direct encounter with Jesus. The priest is only the instrument. So I would you know, encourage everyone to avail of the grace that God is offering through this sacrament of confession and the great mercy that is available to us. And remember the great, great price that was paid for this privilege. So at the moment, I'm a chaplain in a city centre hospital here in Cork City. I really enjoy the work. I've been there for four years. Every day is an adventure because you're meeting new people. I guess on a daily basis, I meet hundreds and hundreds of people. We have 320 patients. I'd see a lot of them every day. Some people come back, of course, for more cancer treatment or whatever is going on. And of course, you meet the relatives as well. And we have 1,500 people working in the hospital too. So it's a busy, busy place, but really fulfilling work. Tiring work, you know, when you get called out in the middle of the night to anoint people and so forth, but very, very fulfilling work. And I learned so much from the patients. And, you know, every day, pretty much every day, I will experience the death of someone and people often say to me how do you win every day and you're coping with death you're coping with people getting bad diagnosis etc it's not easy but when you look at it through the eyes of faith that i'm helping a person to go through a new door you know death isn't the end but rather the beginning of eternal life and it's coming to us all so when you get the great opportunity and privilege to prepare someone for that that when you see them making a good confession when you've anointed them and you're praying for them it is you know a beautiful beautiful experience and to know that this person is going to their true home in heaven or certainly on their way there so i'm very very grateful for the time as a priest that i have spent in the hospital particularly at the beginning of my priesthood i cycle in there to the hospital every day which is something i enjoy as well because when you're inside a hospital all day it's great to get the fresh air so something that helps me in that sense is to get on my bike and cycle for about 10 minutes into the hospital and meeting people along the way and waving to them and so forth it's a wonderful way to travel i like to go for a walk in the evening to just kind of unwind maybe pray a rosary spend a little bit of time on my own and get fresh air again i've really come to appreciate the value of fresh air. But I also like to watch sport. I'd be very interested in the English Premier League, so I'd watch that quite a bit. And, you know, it's great to talk about these sports with people within the hospital as well. It's a great kind of way to um, form relationships and to speak to one another. So sport would be something that, you know, I was very interested in when I was young and I continue to be as a priest. And it is a kind of a, an outlet for me, a way for me to unwind. So I suppose to anyone out there who's watching and maybe considering what they should do with their own life or maybe you're feeling a little bit distant from God or you're struggling in your own faith journey, I would just advise anyone to spend time with the Lord. In order to understand God, you have to make time and room for silence and not only for exterior silence, but also internal silence as well cultivate the relationship with God as you would with a person. And you do that most of all by spending time with him. Read about him in scripture. St. Jerome famously said, I'm sure you've heard it, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. We want to come to know the Lord, we should read about him and how he lived 
his life. And read about the saints. When I started reading about the saints, it inspired me because I saw other human beings living the faith and loving God in a way that we're all called to. There's so many saints to choose from. Get to know their lives and you'll find that there will be a few that you'll be able to connect with more than others and you will learn a lot about how to come closer to Christ through their lives. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcino, Et Spes Nostra Salve, A Te Clamanus, Exules Filieve, A Te Suspiramus, Gementes et flentes, O clemens, O pia, O dulcis, Virgo Maria. I spent much of my 39 years as a priest working with young people and I've constantly found young people to be wonderful, yearning for something beautiful in their lives, yearning for peace, yearning for shalom. That's why I really hope that Shalom uh, Media will be able to communicate that message of hope to young people who are told to expect so little from themselves. And so I really wish the blessing of God to come on all of you who follow the programs with Shalom Media to ensure that young people will hear the good news of the gospel about a God who believes in us. So with that in mind, we ask the blessing of the Lord on Shalom and all that it does and on all of you who follow its programs right around the world. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.